So welcome and thank you for joining us for the uh, Understanding ABA Therapy webinar presented by the Freddie Ford Family Foundation. My name is Felicia Ford and I am the president and founder of the foundation. I am the mother of three boys on the autism spectrum. The Freddie Ford Family Foundation supports underserved families impacted by autism and we are working to raise awareness of autism spectrum disorders. We thank you so much for your joining us today and our featured speaker is Jackie Klein. She is a board certified behavioral analyst. So we're going to dive right in. So Jackie, can you tell us about your background and experience working with ABA therapy? Sure. Uh, first off, thank you, Felicia, for having me today. Um, I'm very excited to have this discussion regarding ABA. Um, and a little bit about me and my background. I have been working in the field of ABA for almost nine years now. Um, my master's degree is in rehabilitation counseling, which is a counseling degree geared towards um, individuals with disabilities. And throughout my time in grad school, I worked as an ABA implementer. Um, so after about a year working um, as a counselor after graduation, I decided that I, you know, kind of liked this uh, behavior analysis and wanted to go back. And um, so I completed a master's course sequence in order to get my certification um, and test to be ABCDA. Um, so in that almost nine years, I've worked in the natural home. Um, I've also done some community-based services. Um, I've worked for Missouri First Steps, which is the early intervention program in the state of Missouri. And currently I work for special school districts. So I'm placed in two early childhood centers um, in the St. Louis area. Um, also over that time, so I've worked all over St. Louis from um, St. Charles to the city, North County, South County, and some into Illinois as well. Um, I've worked with a variety of ages. So I think my youngest kiddo I worked with uh, was one year old and the oldest individual I worked with was 68 years old. Um, I've worked with individuals with a variety of diagnoses, um, different skill sets, different family dynamics uh, and cultures, and a wide variety of challenging behavior as well. So as an ABA or BCBA, ABA therapist, can you tell us what your specific philosophy is for implementing services? Sure. Um, I probably have a couple, but my main one that I find repeating a lot is that when it comes to behavior intervention plans or providing services, developing programming, I like to keep things simple, functional, and fun. Uh, simple because in ABA we rely a lot on others, uh, including family members, parents, teachers, um, all other individuals um, involved in, with the person that we're serving um, to carry over services. So in order for that to be effective, we have to keep things simple and doable. Um, functional, meaning that it's practical, important, um, useful, meaningful for that, that specific individual. Um, and then fun, because you get a whole lot more buy-in from the individual you're working with and those working with them if you keep things fun, um, especially if you're working with the little ones too, of course. And that's why sometimes it looks like play, right? When some parents may watch you interact and think, oh, you're just playing with my child. I don't understand what's happening. Is this therapy or is this play? So have you had that experience? <laughs> Very much so, especially with the younger ones. Um, so working in preschools and then also doing first steps uh, and, and working with the little guys, it does. I mean, you walk into a session and you're like, wait a minute, you're just playing. Um, but so much of those skills that we work on, you can do through play, and that's where you get more buying with the little ones. Uh, they want to engage with you when, when it looks more fun and play-based. So, I mean, we can work on requesting for things during play, um, back and forth, um, engagement, attention, all kinds of different skills we can sneak in through, through a game or activity. So, can you tell us more about what ABA therapy is specifically and how you work together with other therapies like OT, speech, and maybe possibly physical therapy? Sure. Yeah, um, I'll dive in a little bit to try to define ABA first um, and then chat about working with the other service providers. Um, 
ABA is, is sometimes difficult to, to define simply because there's so many things that we cover. Um, so there's, there's lots of, of different paths that could go here. But overall, ABA, it's a science, um, a scientific approach to understanding both learning and behavior. Um, it's an evidence-based approach, meaning that there are decades of research, case studies, and data supporting the effectiveness of ABA strategies. Um, through ABA, we assess behaviors and look at why they are occurring. And then we create strategies to increase the, um, the wanted or the desirable or helpful behaviors. And then we also write strategies to decrease those unwanted or harmful behaviors. Um, and finally, we look at modifying the individual's environment in order to increase the likelihood that learning will occur, okay? So in ABA, kind of the magic word that we all use is positive reinforcement. Uh, we want to implement strategies that are going to increase the likelihood that those behaviors that we want to see will keep happening. And those behaviors that we don't want to see will decrease, okay? Um, so kind of a basic example I'm, I'm going to throw out there that encompasses a lot of what we do in ABA. Let's say when your child wants a cookie, they walk to the pantry door and start kicking the pantry door, okay? Just going to throw this example out there. So when we implement ABA, we look at that behavior of kicking and we assess, okay, why is the kicking occurred? We figured out, okay, they're trying to communicate something. This behavior is communicating that they want the cookie, okay? So that behavior that we identified that we want to decrease is the kicking. But anytime that we decrease the behavior, we need to replace something or we need to replace that behavior with something that will still get them to access what they want, okay? So this could be, vocalizing cookie please or it could be handing you a picture of a cookie or we might even just want to change this to pointing to the pantry door instead of kicking the pantry door okay whatever we decide that is now the behavior we want to increase so moving forward we will only provide that cookie when that appropriate behavior is occurring the request the picture the pointing um, whatever you decide we will no longer be giving the cookie when the when the kicking happens Okay, so therefore we're taking the kicking out of the picture. We're hoping that the kicking decreases as that appropriate behavior increases. Okay, um, so that's kind of a... Did you have something, please? Oh, I was gonna say, so that's what you mean by behavior modification. We're just trying to teach um, new, way, well, partially new ways of communicating and, and replacing their say a meltdown over the over like getting what getting the cookie or whatever to okay say i want the cookie right because there's there's still something there that that individual is trying to communicate so we can't just take away the kicking without giving them an appropriate way to communicate what they're wanting or what they don't want does that make and, sense yes and you're not trying to change so if they do something like because i know behavior modification may sound scary to some people or negative and that's actually not what you're trying to do correct what do, what do you mean like like if they stem so some people think stemming is may that may appear to them as negative maybe the sounds that they make or the actions that they do mm -hmm. um you're not trying to stop that behavior you're trying to stop more of a uh, negative behavior not their natural behavior is that also making sense right so do you you bring you bring us to a good point. Um, so there's a term that we use in the ABA world called socially significant or social significance, I'm sorry. And that means that the strategies that we're implementing have to be socially significant, meaning important, relevant, meaningful to that individual. So we wouldn't wanna jump in and change a behavior that that is not necessary to change or that does not fit with that individual's lifestyle or um, what's important to them. So no, ABA is not coming in and just changing behavior, to, 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 excuse me, to change, to change behavior. There's a reason and a purpose and some kind of meaning behind it. Okay, perfect. Does that make sense? Yes. And so the other portion of my question was, how can ABA work with us, uh, speech therapists or OT, occupational therapists? Yeah, um, sure. So there's, hmm several things that ABA can help address that coincide with OT and speech, right? So 
um, were called in for, you know, concerns with the behavioral concerns we talked about, um, communication. So therefore we rely a lot on speech therapists, social skills, self-regulation, which a lot of times where OT comes in with some of those um, sensory strategies and other self-regulation strategies, independent living skills, toilet training, food selectivity. So those are all kind of examples. Um, and how that fits in with other service providers. Um, so I actually worked with the First Steps uh, speech therapist who described the difference between ABA and speech and OT in a way that just kind of clicked, I think for me and for some other people. Uh, she said to put it simply, speech and OT address the can't and ABA addresses the won't. And I thought that that was just a really good, simple way to describe that. So they work on the skills that, that have not been developed yet, that, that are not apparent, where we work more on the, they're not willing to engage in those skills or willing to engage in that behavior. Um, so some ways that, that we work together nicely, um, the speech therapist I work with right now, she's wonderful. I talk to her probably every day. We collaborate on every child um, and work together a lot to develop programming and strategies. Uh, and it's great, uh, like we talked about before, behavior is so much about communication and being able to replete, replace some of those interfering behaviors with um, appropriate communication in order to do that. It's very helpful to have a speech therapist working with you who knows the best mode of communication that's specific to that individual. Um, another way that we work nicely together is typically ABA services, um, through ABA services, the individual gets a lot more time with ABA because ABA is so um, reliant on repetition um, and increasing the opportunity to work on those skills. So whether you're an in-home service or school-based, you typically see more time spent with ABA than maybe like OT or speech. Um, and so a lot of times we, we, we work on that those learning to learn behaviors and those um, prerequisite skills in order for um, those individuals to be able to maybe sit through a speech that session a little bit longer or be able to attend to a speech or OT session a little bit longer or they've practiced more of the tolerance piece with us so then when they go to a speech session or an OT session um, they're not having to focus so much on the behavior obstacles that they can really focus on their skills and their practice and then be able to hit those skills um, a little harder and a little longer and move forward a little quicker. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Okay. So then can you give us, um, explain to us what the purpose and of the assessments or initial evaluations are and how they look uh, for the families? Sure. Um, so with ABA assessments and evaluations, there's kind of two paths we can go down. Um, so the first one would be those assessments that look at um, basic language and learning skills. So these are the tools that we use to develop more of the um, academic sort of programming, the, the basic um, learning skills where you would see some discrete trial practice, um, kind of the table work that sometimes you see in ABA. And some of those tools are called the VB map, which looks at uh, verbal behavior. You might hear peak or ABLES, and all of these assess those, those basic, um, basic learning and language skills like requesting, um, imitating, labeling, matching or visual, perceptual skills, play skills, following directions, things like that. Um, on the other hand, if we're looking specifically at behavior plans and behavior intervention strategies, um, your BCBA will typically do what's called a functional behavior assessment or a functional analysis. And um, these assessments include observation of the individual. So we're taking data, looking at the behavior of concern that we're assessing, what happens right before and what happens after. Um, in addition to those observations, we do some interviews with people that are closest to that individual, usually with parents, um, teachers, caregivers, to find out a little bit more about behavior, when it occurs, um, what may trigger it, what typically happens after. Um, and then in some, like in a function analysis, we may even set up scenarios where we're testing um, certain situations with the behavior. And all this information will help us 
determine why that behavior is occurring. So then we can put strategies in place in order to um, address those specific behaviors. Okay. Um, and so can you, and so you said like PEAK and ABLES, can you just explain specifically like what does ABLE stand for? What does PEAK stand for? Are they acronyms or is that just specific to you guys? PEAK is not, so view map is verbal behavior. PEAK is not an acronym, right? <laughs> I don't think so, I would have to look back. Um, ABLES is assessment of behavior, language and learning skills, I think. I can look, I can look that up for sure. Okay. It has left my brain because I just use the acronym all the time and I know <laughs> what it assesses. But yes, they're all on that, those basic um, language and learning skills that we're looking at. So basically when you're doing your initial evaluation and assessment, once again, it's something that may, um, to a parent watching it, it, it is observational. You're watching the interactions. You may not, um, I mean, you do interact some, of course, but you're also watching the behaviors and how they respond, correct? That's part of it, but in, in each of the uh, assessment evaluation, typically like I would go in and test some of those, things. like if I'm doing one of the um, learning skills, I would have some materials where I can, you know, put a, a, a matching activity and be able to see like, okay, match this to see where the skills are at. So it, it is hands-on, you're going in and, and assessing some of those skills like with materials while you're there. Um, and some of it is, observational because individuals might work better for someone that they have a relationship built with than myself. So it's, it really just depends on the individual as well. Okay, so then my next question for you is, who provides ABA services? Sure, um, so typically, um, and, in Missouri, uh, you have to be certified and licensed in order to um, provide the overall service, like develop the plan and oversee the implementation of a behavior intervention plan or um, programming strategies. Um, but you may also have what's called an RBT or multiple RBTs on your team. And RBT stands for Registered Behavior Technician. And these are individuals who um, implement the plan or strategies that the BCBA puts in place. Um, and they have, they also have to go through a certification exam. Um, they have supervision requirements of how many, like a percentage of their hours that have to be supervised by a BCBA. Um, over a period of time, they have like ongoing CEU requirements. So, um, they go through a pretty, um, rigorous training process and an ongoing training in order to be able to implement those services. So the BCBA, once again, um, those are the board certified behavioral analysts, which is what you are. And then the RBTs are the registered behavioral technician. <laughs> yes. They like to throw these fancy words at you, but yes. <laughs> Um, so, and there, so, and the difference, the biggest difference is the BCBA sets the plan and the RBA helps to implement it. Correct. Okay. And I think of it kind of like a assistant to the BCBA. Okay. Okay. So then can you tell us who benefits from ABA therapy? I know in the beginning you said like your the age range of people you've worked with from I think one to 65. So um, uh, give us an idea of who benefits and what kind of activities you might do with, along the spectrum of ages. <laughs> if you sure. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, I mean, who benefits from ABA strategies, ABA strategies? I think anybody can benefit from ABA strategies. I use them on myself often. Um, for example, I don't let myself eat ice cream until after I have my workout, right? So I'm kind of increased that likelihood that I'm actually going to work out that night and then later I can have the ice cream. Um, but no, um, yes. So age range, there's, there's a lot, a lot of um, studies and attention and research on early intervention being very effective um, in working 
with the little ones and addressing some behaviors before they become habitual. Um, but that does not mean that ABA is not effective for all ages. Um, for adults, you see a lot of work with um, vocational training, like um, teaching strategies to um, be able to increase independence with certain job skills, um, like using more mature reinforcement systems, um, checklists, task analysis, which is where we break down bigger tasks into smaller steps and teaching them step by step. Um, so there's a way to use these strategies even with adults or school age children, high schoolers, um, work a lot on like social skills and peer engagement is another one um, for older kids. Um, a lot of independent living skills, especially for those individuals transitioning um, away from, from school. Um, there's also kind of this they preconceived notion a little bit. When you hear ABA, you think autism. And that ABA and autism go hand in hand. And there's some reasoning behind that, one being a lot of research, also um, kind of some specifics with funding. Uh, but it is not necessarily just for individuals with autism. There's several different branches of ABA. Um, for example, there's one branch called um, organizational behavior management, which is ABA specific to organizations and um, in the workplace where they go in and work with companies on how to like increase productivity um, and uh, kind of like structural changes um, within that organization or the workplace as well. So lots of different branches. It's just one you hear about the most is working with individuals with autism. Um, did I answer that <laughs> as much as you want? Was there something else you would like me to hit on, Felicia? Um, no, that's good. I mean, because, you know, that's the thing. Some people think it's only for children and individuals with autism, but it actually, it can be used, like you said, for anybody. I find that what I've learned from having the services for my children, it's like, oh, yeah, okay. I see what I need to work on and how I can <laughs> coach myself, if you will. So, um, so I like that because a lot of people are, are, are turned off or kind of given a negative impression of ABA therapy. And that's not um, the therapy as a whole. It may just come down to the provider. So, you know, and so that just segues, segues us into my next question. Um, uh, hmm. How is ABA therapy implemented in home setting, school setting, community clinic? Yeah. Um, so yeah, as Felicia said, there's different settings where ABA might be implemented. So you have your natural home setting where your providers come into your home and work with you and your family um, on some strategies for your child. Um, there is community-based, um, services, which sometimes go hand in hand with natural home. And there's also school services and clinic services. Um, so those are kind of four examples of settings where ABA services might occur. Um, so some differences between those four for natural home services, I think family involvement is key um, because you have to make sure the strategies that you're putting into place, you're working with the family and developing those together and taking into account family dynamic um, and also cultural aspects. Okay. Um, there we go. Um, you always want to make sure, kind of like what we talked about socially significant before, whatever you're putting into place has to be socially significant for that family as well. Um, so some things you might be looking at in the home are home routines like mealtime routine or um, nighttime routine, teeth brushing, kind of things like that. Um, you may also look at interactions with siblings, um, following parent directions, um, play skills in the home, some community stra or communication strategies you can put into place at home, and then sometimes some of those uh, discrete trial training skills as well. Um, Community-based services. So uh, sometimes when you get in-home services, you can also, you can do both in-home and community, just depending on your provider and also your needs uh, as a family and for the individual. 
Um, but typically when you are working on community-based um, services, you're looking at expectations within a public place. So this could be voice volume, um, expected versus unexpected behavior when you're in public, um, tolerating crowds, maybe having to wait for something, waiting in line, um, or even teaching that individual self-advocacy skills um, or independence in, in the community. Um, safety is a big one as well. And also looking at following directions. So following directions in a room when you're the only other person in the room can be simpler than maybe following directions when you're in the middle of Target and there's lots of people around and there's a toy aisle and there's so many, you know, different places to go. So kind of generalizing some of those skills to a more distracting setting. Um, as far as in the school, um, I mean, a lot of, a lot of that learning behavior occurs. So we're looking a little bit more at academics and our learning to learn behaviors. Um, so being able to uh, sit and attend to materials or attend to an instructor, um, be able to do some work tasks for an extended amount of time. Uh, but we're also looking at social play uh, at school. There's other peers that that individual can access. So it's a great opportunity to work on peer engagement and learning how to play with other children or other individuals or interact with other inter individuals. Um, also following routines, communication, and some self-regulation skills as well. And then clinic is, um, is similar to school, but a little bit more intensive in that there's a typically a bigger focus on the services being provided in the therapies. And there's also a smaller, typically a smaller ratio of adults to children. So you, you can, they can do more of that intensive one-on-one -on -one practice and work. And so if you're a parent and you are trying to figure out how to choose a provider, um, what questions should you ask? What should you look for? Sure. I love this question. Um, so I have a couple of good question suggestions, I think, both um, to ask when you're looking for a provider, but also just some initial questions to ask even when you have a provider and you're sitting down talking about what services are going to look like. Um, so the first one I would suggest asking your BCBA is how often will I see you? So how often will that BCBA be in your home or be face to face with your child? Um, just to make sure that, you know, you have someone that will tr truly knows your child um, and therefore can create a more individualized plan for services. Um, another question could be how often can we discuss uh, my child services and um, how often can we check in regarding progress. So communication is key. Um, families should always be involved in services. Um, and as uh, ABA therapists, we are constantly collecting data and analyzing the effectiveness of our programming. So everything we do, we, we collect data, we put it into a graph and we see, okay, is this behavior we're wanting to reduce? Is it, is it going down? And this behavior that we want to increase, is it going up? And if that's not happening, then we have to change something. Our, our strategy is not working, our plan is not working, so we need to modify. And that's something that should always be in communication with the families and with the individual's parents. Um, so constantly checking in on, okay, where are we at? Are, is this working? Um, are we seeing progress? Do we need to change some things? Um, just knowing what's, what's going on during services. Um, also, I think looking for a BCBA who, to that point also, who will make sure that you are involved in both planning and implementation of services, because so many of the strategies that we work on, they don't end, you don't have an ABA se session, then it ends. So the strategies have to be carried over and practiced um, throughout, throughout the day and throughout the days. Um, if you want to really impress your BCBA, you can ask, how is this plan socially significant and meaningful to my child? So have them explain to you, why are we working on this skill? What does this mean for my child? Why is this important for my child? How will this help later on in life? Um, and then I think it's also a good idea just to ask, okay, what does an ideal ABA session look like for you? 
So if it's in your home, like, what does this look like? Are we going to be doing a lot of table time? Can we include other family members? Can we work on routines? Will we be accessing the community or will it be in my home the whole time? Um, really trying to understand what it looks like and then you can kind of compare that to what you have, what you're wanting for your child and see if that is a good fit um, or if that meets your expectations. And if not, then that's a good time to have a discussion of, well, it's not really what I was thinking. How can we incorporate more of this um, or modify the plan? And realistically, parents should not be afraid to ask questions or about um, what's going on or how it's implemented or ask for changes because, you know, that could be, for some people, it's intimidating. You don't know what you can ask, but you can. You can jump in any time and suggest something or say, hey, I'm noticing that my child does this. Can we work on this, right? Yes, absolutely. And I can tell you, Way more often than not, your ABA provider wants that parent involvement, wants that parent engagement, um, because services just, they flow so much better, they make, they're more meaningful, um, they're more effective when everybody's on board, and there's a plan that everybody is willing and able to do. So yes, the more questions, the more involvement, the, the better. And if there's a new behavior, by all means, share it with your BCBA or your RBT so they can figure out how to implement a, an effective strategy. Yes, and tip it, a lot of times if there isn't, you know, a new behavior or a new something that occurs, um, your BCBA might ask you, hey, can you jot down some notes for a couple of days when you see it when I'm not here? You know, maybe write down what time this behavior is happening, what happened right before, how long does it last? And so that, you know, we can look at that and say, okay, I think that this might be why it's occurring um, and just have more of that information to base strategies off of. Absolutely. So um, can you tell us, how should parents or caregivers be involved in therapy? Yes, absolutely. Um, I would say be present. Um, I know, you know, like I said, we cover a lot of a lot of minutes, a lot of time. Sometimes it's not possible to be available and present in every minute of every session. Um, but work out a plan with your BCBA about how often you can be there and see what's going on. Um, consistent communication on strategies and progress. Um, the biggest, biggest thing I think in my notes, I wrote it a couple times just so I remember to hit on it is consistency and follow through. So when, you know, when your ABA session's over that those strategies that are in place, they're still like you're able to implement them consistently and, and follow through with those expectations, even when a session isn't happening, because that's how you're going to see the quickest progress and the more most effective, um, progress. That would be my number one. Yes, because I've enjoyed watching lots of sessions and participating and learning more about not only how it works, but my own kids. Because when you watch a session, you see, oh, so my child can walk and hold hands. What? Because when I try to walk and hold hands, it doesn't happen. So it, it's really good as the parent to be in, as involved as possible. And if you have a provider that is not wanting you to be involved or not, you know, allowing you to watch or participate, that might be a provider that you don't need to have with working with your child. I would say that's probably a red flag. Yeah. Because you should, all, they should always want, they're working with your child, so they should always want your input and your feedback and they, and they should want to actually show you how to interact with your child when they're not there. So, yeah, definitely do not be afraid to speak up at any point if you're uncomfortable or if you want to know what's going on or if you want to know how this strategy is helpful or what did you say, significantly? Socially significant. <laughs> socially significant. So, um, and then, you know, here's my other question is, how can parents support their child after sessions are over in between sessions? What can they do? And that's where the, the consistency and follow through comes into place. So even between sessions, when there isn't somebody there, those strategies, there should always be a parent training um, portion to ABA as well. So being able to carry over those strategies in between um, and have it as similar to, you know, the plan that, that, that your providers are being implemented because What's hard is, you know, you have these strategies during sessions, and then if we don't follow through, then it 
creates kind of a confusing situation where sometimes I have to, but sometimes I don't, where if we're trying to teach something new, we want those expectations to be the same always moving forward. That way those, those behaviors that we want to, to increase, they will increase much faster if we have those same expectations. And you know, and the, the other thing is too, you don't want the behaviors to change only with other people. So if you as the parent or caregiver is consistent, then you're going to see the same changes in the behavior as the, um, the therapist is. Otherwise, you're going to be very upset when how come my child will only sit and quietly and work on something independently with you, but when they're with me, I can't get them to do anything. Well, you know, consistency is key. Your yeah. participation in understanding what we're learning through our sessions is key. So, right. you know, that, that is an important thing to remember. <laughs> yes, and we, we also know that as to the most realistic ex extent as possible, we know it's not going to be perfect. Many people have other children, have jobs, other things going on, of course. Um, but just that the intent is, is there. And maybe it's just, you know, a small thing that we're working on, one small thing that we're working on for now, but that we're constantly trying to work towards that. Yes. And I would also say as a parent with three boys on the spectrum, and they all have different needs, it is helpful to be able to watch the sessions and be able to work with all of them um, to get the desired results. So, for example, for all of you, um, my children, they did not. That when my, I have two twins, so five now and seven now, the twins would not walk anywhere with me or my husband. And so they spent a lot of sessions, I believe, walking up and down hallways at school um, as part of their therapy because they had to learn that you can't just run off. So, you know, and so then we had to implement the same kind of strategies at home where we had to be a lot more strict and we had to practice. So I would say, don't be afraid to practice the strategies. Don't be afraid to take your child in public because some people are. Um, yeah, mine spent a lot of time in shopping carts and not walking through the store. But they learned how to shop without running wild and <laughs> touching everything and grabbing everything. And now they can walk through the store and, you know, participate in a shopping experience that is not awful for myself or my husband. Because when you take three children to the store, it is what it is. That's what I will say. It is what it is. So we, um, so there is a question in the chat. Is ADA therapy beneficial for a child that shows signs of sensory integrative dysfunction? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, as far as like strategies to address specific sensory needs or behaviors related to meeting sensory needs. So what I'm going to do is unmute the person who asked the question, or if you could, please give us a little bit more details in the chat. Um, and we'll be able to okay, help answer your question. I can't unmute. So if you could give us more information. Yes, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So what services would an ABA therapist be able to provide to address some of the um, needs for the sensory piece? Sure. Um, so when talking about behaviors, there are four functions to behaviors, meaning typically four reasons why a behavior occurs. Okay. And those four are um, access to something tangible, like to an item, um, access to attention, escape from something that they don't want to do and what we call automatic reinforcement which a lot of time is that sensory piece that you're talking about so they are trying to seek some sort of sensory input um, so some of those that you might hear hear of most often um, would be like hand flapping um, putting things in their mouth um, some individuals might spin in circles like those kinds of behaviors 
Um, and so what we would do with that is again, we would always start with an assessment to make sure, okay, this is what's happening. This behavior is occurring for some kind of automatic reinforcement to meet some kind of sensory need. Um, and then we would look at, okay, what is that sensory need that, that needs to be met? And can we come up with some kind of replacement to meet that sensory need um, that might not be as harmful or distracting um, than the behavior that's currently happening, if that makes sense. Um, we may also look at trying to implement a, an appropriate time where that individual can en engage in that sensory seeking behavior, but maybe not at other times when they need to focus on schoolwork or um, engage in some kind of activity that is not um, conducive to that behavior occurring at the same time. Hope that answers your question. Very good. Okay. I hope that did answer your question. And I hit on mute. So if you have anything else to follow up, feel free. Thank you very much. It, it definitely answered the question for me, but I do have just a follow up with that. Can you kind of talk about, because this, the, the, um, Characteristics that you just mentioned, the spinning, the wanting to put things in the mouth, the flapping of the hands. Can you kind of touch a little bit on what may possibly be causing those things? Is it a, a sense of calm? Just something that I can kind of understand or relate it to to kind of make it make sense. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, it, and when you get into these kind of behaviors, it, it is tricky because I don't have a for sure answer for you. I have some things that it, it could be, um, but a, a very flat out, this, this is what's going on. I, I don't have that, especially without uh, knowing the child and kind of being able to see what's going on. Um, a lot of times it's, um, there's some kind of need, like that child may feel the need to have, to explore something with their mouth if it's, if it's that, that mouthing piece. Um, a lot of times with individuals with autism, there is this sort of comfort in um, behaviors that are repetitive um, predictable behaviors, kind of knowing what's coming. Um, you see that a lot with uh, children who will, you know, play short clips of videos over and over again. Um, so that could be it, of that, that comfort of, of knowing what exactly is going to happen. There isn't any anxiety of, I don't know what's about to happen because I can control this and I, and I know it. Um, trying to think of sometimes too just regulating being able to regulate um, their body so you hear a lot of OTs use the term knowing where their body is in space um, so kind of that feeling of not having full control over over movement or needing um, some deep pressure to remind them where their body is in in the space around them um, so those are kind of some examples of of what's going on and actually that connects us back to Felicia to your previous question about how services can work well with each other. So um, typically when we have kiddos that have that those sensory needs and need for sensory input, we work closely with an OT to develop those replacement strategies or to figure out, okay, what is it that they need that might help them? So if it is that, that pressure, we might work into the day, um, like sensory breaks, where proactively we offer squeezes or we offer time to be rolled up in a blanket. We offer time on a swing um, proactively so that need, that sensory need is met before behaviors occur that are seeking out that, that sensory need. And that's really important because I know my, my uh, son had um, sensory supports built into his daily school schedule. So he knew that he had breaks he could take where they had a sensory path right outside the room where he could do that and come back and focus instead of him maybe, you know, I'm not saying he rolled around on the floor, but I don't know. I wasn't at school. So, you know, but he does, he actually, he does wander. He's one of those kids that he doesn't always sit still quietly, but he may walk around the room quietly while you're talking. So they allowed him the flexibility of, hey, this is what we can give you. You can go take your sensory breaks and, and do this activity and come back and then he was able to focus more. So that is, that, that's key. They need to have those opportunities to express their needs or get those needs met in a kind of a controlled way. 
So I had one other question for you. Um, for some people who may have behaviors that they want corrected, and like you said, it's not necessarily that you have to have a, a individual with autism to get services. So how do you get, uh, do you need a referral for ABA therapy? So this is, there's, there's also not one clear, of course, there's not one clear answer to this as well. Um, it depends on your provider, it depends on the setting, it depends on your situation. What's tricky right now um, is if you're talking about in-home services or any in services where your insurance will cover those. So that could happen in clinic, that could happen in home, community. Um, as of now, insurance companies require a medical autism diagnosis with an ICD-10 code um, in order to qualify for services. So although, yes, generally speaking, ABA can help individuals, whether you have an autism diagnosis or not, from a funding perspective right now, because this is where the research is, insurance companies will only um, authorize services for individuals with an autism diagnosis. So that kind of touches on that, that first piece a little bit. As far as a referral goes, that also depends on your setting um, and provider as well. Um, so some places may require a doctor referral. Some might just be you calling and saying, my, you know, my child has an autism diagnosis, this is what I'm seeing, and they'll do a little intake um, with first steps. So kids don't come into first steps with ABA, but they would be referred from another service provider to be evaluated for ABA. So it really just kind of depends on the setting, the provider, and, and the situation. But if you want to private pay, is that something um, you can do? Yeah, so that, that is an option. Um, unfortunately, it's not a, um, it, it will be a, probably an expensive route, but yes, private pay is an option. And um, with providers, and I know some, I think most providers would accept, um, I shouldn't say most, I know some providers will um, accept private pay and you don't have to have a diagnosis in order to get services. So ABA would not uh, be a means to teach a parent how to parent. It would just be, but if there are significant behaviors that need to be corrected, um, that may be a route someone might want to go and get private pay services. Like if, they're, if the child's a danger to themselves and they just haven't learned how to do that, then that might be a route that they could take. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you, I mean, there's a number of different diagnoses out there where, you know, that where you see some of these behaviors we're talking about, but then, you, you know, you also have kids that may not have a diagnosis, that there's just a behavioral challenge going on that you might want some guidance or some training or some collaborative work to come up with a plan to kind of help that situation. And that's not dependent on a, a diagnosis. That's just life. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, at this point, I am opening it up to anyone that may have a question uh, for Jackie before we, we uh, wrap this up. Does anyone have a question they want to share in the, in the chat? And then I can uh, unmute you so you can ask. But we do want to keep the questions as general as possible, being mindful that um, some questions require an evaluation and she's not, if she's not familiar with your child, she's familiar with mine, but if she's not familiar with your child, it would be difficult to uh, do a specific question. So I'll give you guys just a few more minutes. So Jackie, this has been great. Um, great information. I think, well, I hope everyone has a better understanding of ABA therapy now. It's not um, I don't want to say the big monster that I've, I've personally heard it to be, but, um, but it is, it can be incredibly helpful um, for everyone and anyone that has um, a child with behaviors that they need help with. So um, I am seeing no questions. So um, I am going to go ahead and Thank you 
so very much for joining us. It was a pleasure having you. Um, I hope everyone learns a lot about ABA therapy and how beneficial it is. If you have any questions or come up with a question later, please feel free to email um, or um, send a message on our Facebook group, which is Fred Ford um, Foundation, Family Foundation. Uh, or you can visit our website, which is readyfordfamilyfoundation.com, and we can give more information or try to answer any questions that you may have. But thank you, everyone, for your time. It has been great. And uh, Jackie, thank you. Thank you.